uh, carrying on with our series this morning entitled, He Leads Me, and it's part two. And our key scripture is Psalm 23, verse 3, where literally that, these are words of scripture, folks. The words of scripture that say in Psalm 23, verse 3, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. In the New Living Translation, it says this, that He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to His name. And, and my, my inspiration is this, I find so often there's so many Christians that do life, but they don't tap into this great privilege of having your good shepherd leading you. They literally bumble through life, whether it's relationships, whether it's major business deals, whether it's buying or selling houses or cars, whether it's where to go, where to stay, where to work, all these big life decisions that they just seem to make you know the saying, on a wing and a prayer, they, they kind of don't even do the prayer part. They just make it on a wing. They just, I'm going there, I'm doing this, etc. And, and it's, it's sometimes concerning to me that where you have this incredible privilege of tapping in to a loving Father who has good plans for you, and, and He can guide you and He can lead you, but you don't, you don't tap into that. And then things don't work out, and things smash up, and, you know, and then you want to blame God. But it's like, well, were you pursuing God? Was that God's will? Was that God's plan for you to go there, study that, work there, marry that person, etc.? And so this is, this is just how Christians roll. We follow the Lord. The Lord leads us. It's a joy. And so we can have a deep sense of peace and contentment in our heart in every season of our life, knowing we're in the same of His will, that He's led us to this space, to this place, and He wants us to stay here or to move there or whatever, that God has led us. I don't know how you live otherwise. I don't know why you want to live without following the Lord, without following His leading. And so I just want to put this scripture up, Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14. Now most of you know verse 11. Uh, we've actually got it, uh, a template of it on our, on our wall in our lounge. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. What are these plans like? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And most Christians put a big full stop after that verse. They quote it. They pray it. Yes, God's good, good plans for me. I can just carry on and live whatever way. And these amazing plans are just going to unfold for me. But look at how this scripture carries on. Verse 12, 13, and 14 are important. Because you now know God has good plans for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future, not to harm you. What is your response? This is your response. Then you will call upon me. That's God speaking here. You'll call upon the Lord. Because you know He's got good plans, you therefore seeking the Lord. And come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Folks, what is the response to you know God has amazing plans for you? Personally, customized just for you. What's your response? I'm going to seek God. I'm going to devote myself to the purposes of God. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask. The Bible says in James, says, you don't have because you don't ask. So many Christians, they're going on, they smash their life and they come, Pastor, God doesn't love me. God's forsaken me. Like, have you sought the Lord? Is that root? Was that option? Do you, was that God's will? Did you pray about it? No, I didn't pray. God, the Bible says God's good, good plans. Well, then we should seek Him. Amen? This is where we are. I'm wanting to provoke you to seek God for His plans for your life. Amen? I want to contrast this with, with a very real sobering reality. Do you know that the enemy, that Satan, the devil, has plans for your life? It is a plan that you will smash up and bash up and mess up every dimension of your life. The Bible says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to mess it up. Whose plans are your, you following? I want to submit to you. You know, default, the default option. You know, on, on any computer, the default option is certain. They look certain ways. There's certain colors, and this is how things look. But you can change that. The default 
is not necessarily that you are amazing in the center of God's will all the, all the time. Because this scripture says, because you know that he has good plans, you will seek him. Amen? You will seek him for his plans. And I, and I shared last week also just the, from uh, um, Acts chapter 13, where they were fasting and they were praying. They were devoting the, the, they were devoted to seeking God. And then he said, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. And they went on their first missionary journey. Folks, are you willing to seek the Lord for the good plans? Because if you're not, don't blame God 10 years from now when your life is a smash up and a mess up. Just remember and consider, did you seek the Lord for his plans? Because let me tell you, not every open door, not every opportunity is necessarily from God. Just because you're getting being offered a big fat salary in Joburg doesn't mean that's from God. That could absolutely be a, a strategy from the enemy to get you out of God's will for your life. Just because you're getting more money doesn't mean it's necessarily from God. What happens if He's planted you and He wants to use you as a pillar in the house of God where He has planted you, but you're just running after a bigger pay paycheck? Folks, God has good plans. Are you willing to seek Him? So, last week I put up how we navigate the voyage of life, and I put five dimensions. And we're using the metaphor of going on a sailing ship, because that was one of the, one of the popular ways of travel even 2,000 years ago. Uh, it was a very effective uh, relatively safe way of traveling compared to walking on land and avoiding gangsters and tzotzis as you go. And I, and I just highlighted this, the five things that we need as we navigate the voyage of life. We need a map, we need a compass, we need a captain, we need a telescope, and we need a crew. If you're going on a ship, you don't get on the ship by yourself. There's no captain who can navigate. That was his main job was he had the navigation skills. He now knew how to read the maps and the charts. He knew how to use the, the compass and the telescope and get you where you want to go. Amen. And there was a crew. The captain couldn't drive the ship by himself because these massive sails required a lot of work to adjust them and move them, etc. You needed a trained crew that knew what to do, etc. to get you to your destination. And I want to say it's a very good metaphor for the journey of life, the voyage of life that every one of us have. And I want to say, folks, all five of these, and you could probably add another six or, no, number six or seven that are important. I just wanted to keep it simple and keep with, within the metaphor. But folks, any one of them by themselves, I want to say, can be dangerous. Last week, you remember... I was joking. I was listening to myself. I, I, I'm sorry if I got a bit carried away. And I said, if a guy just comes to you and said, God told me uh, that you're my wife, that you must marry me. I said, I remember I, was, I, was, I got carried away and I said, are you going to slap him first or are you going to come and tell me? And then we both slap him together. Now, why was I saying this? Because, folks, firstly, I have, I have heard too many stories of beautiful young Christian ladies whose life's been messed up because some good dude pulled out the spiritual prophetic big gun and said, God told me you're the one for me. Folks, these other dimensions are meant to be checks and balances or guardrails. You know when you go on a highway, yes, there's a white line that marks and a yellow line and various lines mark where you should drive, but around sharp corners, there are also guardrails to stop you from crashing down the cliff on the other side. These other dimensions are guardrails, folks. For some big dimensions and big life decisions, it's not just, you know, one little scripture or one prophecy. There you go. You're moving to Timbuktu, you know, for whatever reason. Very often, you need a season of seeking God. I, I was speaking to some of my pastor friends, and uh, particularly when they are, uh, uh, considering moving on in ministry, they, they commit to a time of discernment, a season of discernment. And that could be a few months where they will commit themselves to pray and seek God. Is it time for me to move on, leave this ministry assignment to another one? It's a couple of months. And, in the, you know, one little scripture, one prophecy doesn't cut it. There are a number of things that you're looking at that need to align, that you confirm, yes, I believe this is the man that God wants me to marry. Amen? Or this is the career path that God has for me. Or this is the city that He's calling me to stay 
rain and to plant and put my roots down and see the kingdom of God come where he's planted me. Amen. And so we cannot take these things out of context. I mean, there's one of them, the word of God. If any of the others contradict the word of God, sorry, you just chuck it out and you just exit left. Okay. So these, this, this is, these work together. You can't just navigate a ship just with a compass or just you have a captain. Okay, he needs a crew, he needs a ship, and etc. So these things work together. And I'm just so disappointed. Firstly, people who don't seek God, but secondly, people who just run off, just take one sliver of so called leading of the Lord, and they're off. Absolutely, I love your heart to obey God. But listen, just discern correctly and with wisdom with your mentors your friends have you got faith and peace amen um jesus the holy spirit they won by the way amen when you say holy spirit leads you it is the spirit of christ so let's not get that out of whack over there our conscience the bible we unpacked it last time i want to highlight this now for you i want to highlight this there are we looking at a map over there etc but in this map of life there are places and spaces that it's not good for you to go with your ship. Your ship will get smashed up, whether it's a coral reef, whether it's rocks, whether it is just, um, there are some places on the globe where all those old sailing ships just couldn't go because of the high winds. Like, for example, it was precarious to go, to, to go, to go around the southern tip of South America in winter with the winds and gales. It was precarious. And so... In the old days, when they did maps, what uh, this was in the 1500s, the guys who did maps, there were places uh, in the world that they didn't know what it looked like over there. So to warn sailors, the, guy had, the guys who had maps, they literally would draw scary uh, sea creatures. And in Latin, there's some maps that you can actually see them today where they say, monsters be here. Okay. So that's why I put that picture up there. Uh, there's a picture that I found of an old map with a ship with, you know, you know, I, I couldn't, find, well, you don't need Latin and nor do I. So, so there were scary places on certain maps that they would say, don't go there. Now, you know, kind of, yeah, okay, I'm not worried about going in the ocean and, 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 and monsters, etc. Reality is, though, in the, in the voyage of life, there are places that could unlock spiritual consequences and spiritual forces of wickedness in high places that you and I don't want to mess with. That we could absolutely call, you, you know, scary things. You can unlock, knowingly or unknowingly, you can unlock doors in your life through ignorance or stupidity or through pressure, peer group pressure, etc. Unlock things in your life that you really don't want. Where the enemy has now a legal right to come and steal and kill and destroy in your life. And I'm not going to tell scary stories because I want you to sleep at night, okay? So, but I just want to say, that's kind of a picture, but it's true in life. There are certain places, don't go there. Don't open that door, okay? There are some occultic practices, occultic games, you know, spiritual games where you are, you know, moving the glass around the table. You open that door, you have no idea the spiritual force of wickedness that you are dealing with, that you are opening up into your life. You don't go there. Amen. And I want to highlight places and spaces to avoid as we navigate the voyage of life. Now, some of them are spiritual, some of them just purely practical. But I can't, I, it's important, in a sense, I want to say, if you don't follow the leading of your good shepherd, who are you following? Where are you going to go? Because we are all influenced by all kinds of forces around us. The Bible speaks about don't get being tossed and turned by every wind of doctrine. There are all kinds of people out there. I mean, it's coming into election time. All kinds of political voices trying to vie for your attention. Trying to say, yeah, listen to me, follow me, vote for me. Are you going to follow every voice that vies for your attention and says, here I am, look at me? Who are you listening to? So let's look at this. Let's go to the next slide. First one. We can't follow cultural or social trends that do not align with God. Now, some of them are just plain stupid. Now, I don't know if you guys noticed, a couple of years ago, it was fashionable for guys not to fasten their pants around their waist, but to allow their pants to drop 
like way below their butt and, you know, literally restrict their, with them walking. Have you seen those guys that walk down the, 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 you know, like this, down the shops? And they're flashing their jocks to everybody. Now, how many of you think that is a very clever cultural trend and social norm? I mean, I, I, I want to walk down, the, down the, when I go to the shops. I don't want to trip over my pants because they're now falling down amongst my knees. And I, I haven't found a girl who thinks that's actually amazing. I kind of want to, I wish some girl would go up to some of those guys. Well, I don't know if it's still a trend. Would go up to them and say, listen, my man, you're being an idiot. Just pull your pants up. It doesn't turn me on at all. Girls, could you do that for me? I mean, how many would you agree there are some fashion trends that just don't make sense, okay? Let me tell you. I mean, I just want to tell you. You know, a woman has been created to be the most beautiful, attractive thing to her husband one day when on the wedding night, amen, she reveals herself to him in all her glory, okay? And until then, you don't need the rest of the world to see your glory, okay? I mean, the trends now, you know, now it's a show as much belly button as possible. Listen, I know you've got a belly button. You don't need to show me. It's okay. Keep it for your husband one day, okay? And it's not just belly button that gets shown. Let's not go there, okay? But there are... There are cultural or social trends that do not align with God and God's Word. Let's not be stupid and follow them. Amen? Okay. Look at some scriptures. Exodus 23 verse 2 says, Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. There are some things that people are doing today that it's just stupid to follow them. Romans 12 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. How many want God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for their life? Well, don't follow the world's cultural trends that says, tie your belt around your knees, it really looks cool. You're going to fall and hurt yourself, okay? John 1 John 2 verse 17, And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You know that fashion trend that says, tie your pants around your knees, that trend is going to fade away, amen? And then you're going to be the only tootsie walking around the shops with your pants tied around your knees, and it's like, oh, sorry, that was fashion 10 years ago. It's fading away. Bible says anyone who does these things, no, no, sorry, uh, uh, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. I think it's okay to have your pants around your waist, okay? I want to just mention, I mentioned, folks, cultural social trends. I've actually been praying about this year. You know, 2024, this year, more than half the world's population are going to the polling booth to vote for the government leaders across the world. It's, it's, in, it's un, un, unprecedented how many nations are actually going to vote, including sunny South Africa. We're going to go vote. Now listen, folks, I want to tell you, there are some people, there are some politicians who are wanting you to get angry and offended and remember all the pain from your past so that you will hate fellow South Africans and vote for them. I'm asking you, don't get sucked into the political vortex of some people who are wanting to, for selfish ends, for selfish political ends, get you to support them. We have a beautiful multicultural congregation. I'm telling you, in years gone by, during election years, I have felt... Um, relations between diff people from different cultural groups, the tension just going up like this. And I'm like, what's going on? This is something I said on Sunday. And I realized, no, it's what, because what somebody said at some political rally over there and what's said on the news and what was tweeted on Twitter, etc. Folks, don't let those things destroy your values that you value every person for who they are despite cultural background. We're not going to be sucked into the politics of our past where I don't trust you and I don't like you because you're different to me. I refuse to live like that. Amen? I was born in that South Africa and I love the fact that I worship in a multicultural congregation. We don't judge people by the color of their skin. Amen? And don't let any politician get in your head and tell them that because you've got a white pastor or you're a black person that therefore there's something wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen? 
God is a God of the nations. Amen. He said, go make disciples of all the nations. He didn't just say these color nations or those nations. All nations are welcome. And if Christ is in your heart, there's a greater unity inside of us that could ever divide us because of we are different on the outside. Can we say amen to that? So we're not going to be sucked into some cultural and social trends and winds of, of, uh, that are going to blow this year. I want to ask you, guard your heart, guard your mind about some of the rubbish some politicians are going to say. I know, wait to say and are waiting for your itchy ears to hear them. Say, I'm not listening to you. I'm not going to be provoked. Amen? Can we still be a prophetic voice and a light that God can change people? Amen? Let's go on. Next, uh, and, uh, okay. um, <laughs> another cultural social trend. How much time on average does a person spend on social media? Why am I putting this? Bill Gates uh, in the early 90s when the internet was being developed. Now, Bill Gates, he, he was the founder of Microsoft, which uh, Windows, most PCs run Windows, etc. He, he was the founder of the company that did that software. He's a multi, multi-millionaire. Bill Gates said when the internet was developed, he was so excited because he thought it will make the world a better place. Why did he say that? Because he says, now for the first time, everybody has equal access to information. And therefore, we have equal access to information. We will not be able to be um, subject to propaganda and one-sided views and, and etc. And we will therefore be able to make uh, wise and reasonable decisions regarding everything. You know, the opposite is actually true. American politics is more divided than ever in the history. If you're on the right, you hate lefties. Lefties hate righties, etc. And they will not listen to each other. And you know the reason why? Because the social media feeds that they listen to are just people who have exactly the same views as them that also hate lefties or also hate righties. And so the anger and the offense and the hatred of the other side just gets amplified and literally, they, they, they talk about many people in social media, they're in an echo chamber. You know what an echo is? I mean, you know what an echo is when you, when you shout something and it comes back to you. Now, an echo chamber is literally, you, you can create a room where literally whatever you say comes back at you. Is that healthy? What happens if you're believing a lie? If you're filled with hatred towards other people that think different to you, and you speak your hatred and all that hatred comes back to you, and you become more hatred of the people that you don't like. Do you think that's good and healthy for, uh, for South Africa? It's not good, no, good for America either. Amen? And so this is the problem with social media. You end up in an echo chamber just hearing the stuff you want to hear. And what Bill Gates said doesn't actually happen. Look at, the, look at these stats over here. The typical user spends 2,5 hours per day on social media, according to Data Reportal. Now, I've actually seen other reports that say there's a lot more. There's a conservative view. This was in the middle of last year, June last year, this report came out. They said further, that's 864 hours a year, equivalent to 36 days or over a month, looking at how beautiful, successful, and happy other people are. Hey? How many of you noticed on social media, everybody seems to be so happy, so beautiful, so successful, and your life is miserable, and you look in the mirror and you say, I don't look anything like that, and I'm definitely not as happy as they are, etc. How does that break down? Extended over a lifetime, the numbers become staggering. These people spend nearly six years of their lives on socials, comparing themselves to others instead of living their own lives. Six years, folks. That's longer than you in high school. Although I know some of you are in high school for many years, okay? But usually, high school is usually about five years. But this isn't just the school you, time you're at school. This is the time you're after school. This is the time you s were sleeping, were meant to be sleeping, etc. This is 24-7, six years of your life on socials. L being in an echo chamber, get, getting more depressed about how miserable your life is, or getting more angry about how how dumb the other people are, whoever you think those people are dumb. Is that a clever way to live? You know, let me contrast this to you. We're doing a Bible reading plan. Everybody's so excited about it. Four minutes a day in the Bible, and not everybody can even do four minutes a day. But on average, they spend two and a half hours on social media. What do you think is going to shape your life more? Two and a half hours seeing beautiful, happy, successful people um, all day and making yourself feel miserable or reading the word of God that says I have good plans for you plans to prosper you and not to harm you seek me and I will be found by you how much more will that impact your life than getting miserable by how happy everybody else is and you don't seem to be this 
is. Folks, when we talk about seeking God, don't go on social media and Instagram to find God's will for your life. God could miraculously use Instagram. I agree. But how about seeking Him in the ways that I've highlighted? Next point. We can't follow friends who are not following the Lord. Okay. Show me your friends and I will show you your destiny. I heard that quote years ago. Show me your friends and I'll show you your destiny. Your friends are a bunch of tzotzis. You're going to end up in jail or you're going to end up being killed together with them. Because that, you know, live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Look at these scriptures. These scriptures say, that, um, 1 John, do not let anyone lead you the wrong way. 1 Corinthians 15, this verse says, stop fooling yourselves. Evil companions will corrupt good morals and character. Come back to your right senses and awaken to what is right. Repent from your sinful ways. For some have no knowledge of God's wonderful love. There are people who don't know God, folks. And if you are following them, there's a difference, and we're going to highlight, there's a difference where you are, you are wanting to influence them. But when they are influencing you, you've got to draw the line and saying, sorry, whoa, whoa, we have some boundary issues here we need to establish. Proverbs 13, 20, Who you walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. Many people, they suffer harm. And it's like, how come, why did you make that stupid decision? Oh, my friend made me do it. We were going there as friends. I mean, I know, I know somebody, uh, I won't mention names, that they got in with the wrong crowd at school, and um, they were really enjoying uh, high school, matric, etc. And they decided they were going to fail matric so they could come back and have more party time, you know. And unfortunately, this person was actually too clever to fail. He just passed, got like 51,3%, you know. Passed. He was not allowed to repeat matric, but he was also not, not able to get into university. That was quite a few years ago, and the consequences of that decision, this person's had to bear their whole life. Why? Because this person was trying to be in with the cool kids who are going to fail to party more the next year. Suffers harm. Jeremiah 15, 19, you must influence them. Do not let them influence you. This is the key thing, folks. This is the key thing. Do not cut friends off just because, you know, whatever, you are trying to be holier than them. That's not the motive. Your motive is to influence them for the gospel. But if they are influencing you negatively, if they're telling you, hey, we're going to fail my trick, it's going to be so cool, holier, another partying, whoa, I don't need that influence in my life. I'm not going to be friends with you anymore. But if you can influence them and say, guys, that's a really stupid idea. We really need to do our best to honor God and glorify God. Let's not try and fail the trick. Well, that's different. You must influence them. Do not influence you. If they're influencing you, folks, we need to establish some boundaries. Amen? Let's move on. You can't follow other spirits or occult signs to seek God. To seek direction, sorry, to seek direction. Many people are looking for a sign, all kinds of occultic signs. In Ezekiel, it describes the king of Babylon, says, now stands at the fork, uncertain whether to attack Jerusalem. So this is a pagan king. Okay, Babylon is a symbol of, of, uh, of, of paganism, etc. And he calls his magicians, okay, not the man of God, the prophet of God. He calls his magicians to look for omens or signs. Okay, these are occultic signs. What do they do? They cast lots by shaking arrows from the quiver. So that's one of the ways, you know, shake arrows out the quiver, see how the arrows fall, and then the magician says, oh yes, mm, you need to attack by sunrise tomorrow or else, or don't attack. He's reading, he's reading the signs, okay? Or, look what it says. They cast lots by shaking arrows from the quiver, they inspect the livers of animal sacrifices. So they would sacrifice the animal, and in those times, uh, out of all your organs, apparently the liver is actually one of the biggest, heaviest organs. So they, back in the day, thought the liver had great significance. And then the magician would take the liver, feel the liver, you know, I don't know what he did with it, look at it, wobble it, you know, shake it. And then tell you what the liver says. Should you attack Jerusalem or not? Okay? Now, to us today, that seems dumb. But listen, folks, there was a very important spiritual dimension to this that was happening. Okay? These were magicians that were calling on occultic spirits. 
spiritual forces that are not God, okay, that the Bible mentions. Every culture throughout the centuries has tapped into spirits that are not of God, okay? In every culture, it looks different. It's not cool, doesn't matter what your cultural background is, okay? We're not picking on this culture or that culture. My cultural background, uh, I mean, is from Central Europe. Uberholzer comes from Central Europe. They were pagans who followed all kinds of occultic practices. Praise God, we don't do that anymore, okay? Now, what I want to do is show you this scripture, okay? Hold on to your horses, okay? Are you ready for this scripture? Deuteronomy 18, 10 to 12. Do not let your people practice fortune-telling or use sorcery, okay? That is, that's basically forms of witchcraft. Or interpret omens and signs. Or engage in witchcraft, or cast spells or curses, or function as mediums or spiritists, or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It wasn't acceptable to the Lord in those days. All the pagan cultures around them, this is the kind of stuff they did. They consulted the dead. They consulted spirits. They tried to discern leading from livers and from arrows and etc., it still happens today in every kind, every kind of culture. It's still not cool today. It wasn't cool, uh, you know, 3,000 years ago. It's still not good for, uh, according to God. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. I mean, they even did, I mean, I didn't put the verse up before that, they would sacrifice their children, their sons and daughters to these spirits to get leading and guiding. Now, I heard a story, uh, I mean, a few years ago, uh, a lady called... Um, what is her name? She was a third generation spiritual medium or spiritist at the bottom over there. Um, just trying to think of her name. She actually became a pastor down in Durban. Fiona Desfontaine. There we go. Thank you, Orne. Fiona Desfontaine. I heard her and she shared this firsthand. She spoke at a conference we had in Cape Town a few years ago. And she was a third generation spiritist or spiritual medium. Her granny was, her mother was, and the whole thing was they were trying to discern, you know, does she have the third eye? Have you seen those pictures of the third eye? It's like, is she awake? Does she have the gift, the spiritual gift to listen to the spirits and give people direction? And so that was her job. She literally, people would come and consult her, and I don't know if she used a crystal ball or tea leaves or whatever. She would give people spiritual, spiritual direction, reading the crystal ball, etc., but also, she had the gift of healing. She would heal people using these spiritual powers that she got from her mom and her grandmother, etc. And she became a Christian, and, and something incredible happened. After she became a Christian, she had deep conviction that this was wrong. And she knew she was not, this was not godly. The spirits that she was engaging with was definitely not the Holy Spirit. They were demonic spirits. And so, she decided to contact 20 people who she had healed using her spiritual gifts, etc. Staggering, staggering finding. She, it was so sobering. She found out of the 20 people that she had done spiritual healing to, there was something like 17 of them had in two or three years after they received the spiritual healing, had major, major car accidents and some of them had actually been killed. And for her, it was so sobering. Literally, she spoke to us and she said, you make a contract with the devil, he's going to come back for payment. There's nothing for free with him. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, absolutely, the devil loves to copy what God does, but he will come back and say, you better pay me back. And, and, and very often, the payment is not something you can afford or you want to give. And so, this happens in every culture. And so, I want to play a video for you. This video... Is, is, is quite significant. It's for, uh, by a young lady called Mpo. And um, I, 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 I found this testimony of hers online, uh, on, on, on YouTube, and we can also share it with you. But her cultural background is she had a, a, a traditional African background mixed with Christianity. And then listen to her story. But listen to this. Jesus appeared to her. And just listen to how she shares this. So let's watch this video quickly. My name is Mpo. I grew up with my grandmother and I'm from a traditional background. 
as well as Christian. So at home we'll practice traditional ceremonies and also go to church on Sunday. My father was an Inyanga, so since I was a little girl, I also used to have dreams. And I will see mostly past relatives. I will then narrate it to my grandmother, and she will explain that it's because I have a calling. It started to get dry when I was doing grade nine. And then my mother took me to a doctor because I was sick. And then the doctor said, they can't see anything wrong with me. And then a friend of his, invited over to a Nyanga for a reading and she went with me and then the Nyanga confirmed that I was getting all these illnesses because I was called by an ancestor. The Nyanga said then we can appease the ancestors instead so we made a Mukete which is a ritual to appease ancestors and then they asked the ancestors on my behalf for them to wait for me until I finish my high school and I finish my uh, college. So I decided to then go again to consult to the same Inyanga and then she said this thing will continue to happen with me until I accept my calling as an Inyanga. So that's how we started the ritual of Ukutwaza, which is a process of you getting ready. They prepare you to be initiated. And I remember the lady who was helping me, she prepared a bath for me, which is a sign of accepting that now I'm ready to be initiated. And then they also gave me articles that I need to have at home as a practice so every time i will go into my room i will call upon the ancestors i was taught that i need to call the dead spirit or the river spirits they are the ones who will then give me guidance i was also required to go to the gravesite so i will take a candle with me and then burn umpepu and a, a traditional beer which is umkumboti so it was part of the ritual. I was fearful, especially because of the dreams that I will get. I will sometimes dream about my past relatives, especially my grandmother and my aunt. I was given a choice to choose between my ancestors and there was this gentleman also sitting down on my bed. And I remember when I looked at my grandmother I, and my aunt, there was this terrifying um, feeling about it and I couldn't choose them. For a reason, I managed to choose this calming spirit with this gentleman. He had the, you know, like a light, glorious robe. And then I would see also myself sometimes being drawn to a river and I will see myself walking towards and there will be a reed next to the river. And every time when I will get close enough to get into, I will wake up. I wouldn't have peace myself because sometimes I will find myself speaking to myself when people will be watching me. So I was also searching for God, but I didn't know how to get there until I listened to this preacher who made it clear that the only way to God is through Christ Jesus. Amazing As I was listening to him, he was teaching mostly about the things that I was doing, like consulting the dead and having your own high place, which is the thing that God doesn't want us to do. And I remember having this fear also in my heart that I really need to, you know, search the scriptures more and find out what is really there that I'm doing that God wasn't really happy about. So I remember accepting Christ Jesus after following a prayer that you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And then I prayed the prayer of salvation. I took all the articles of Okutwazan and then I took a shaver, also shaved my head and then I burned everything because I wanted to renounce the practice and it was like a new beginning for me. And when I accepted Christ, I managed to find, you know, my spiritual healing that I was longing for. As a person, I felt 
really liberating like i was being taken out of prison so now instead of thinking what i used to think i'm thinking what the word of god is concerning my life what do i need to do that is pleasing to god and the bible says it is only by faith that i can please god not by works not by rituals not by calling ancestors or appeasing them or giving them sacrifices it's only by you know following what the word of god is saying that i can live a new life Thank you, Mpo. What a powerful test me. I want to just highlight a couple of things that Mpo said. Uh, the, the fact that Jesus appeared to her. Did you hear that in a test me? I've heard so many stories uh, throughout the world where the Lord appears to people directly and personally. She said, I was given a choice between my ancestors and this gentleman sitting on my bed. When I looked at my grandmother and my aunt, there was this terrifying feeling about it, and I couldn't choose them. Folks, you have a choice. You have a choice. I managed to choose this calming spirit with this gentleman. I, he had a light, glorious robe. That's how she described him when she first saw him. Remember, then she was seeking God, and she was like, how do I do this? What and then she heard this preacher preaching, and... And folks, I want to say, people may have an encounter with Jesus, but they still need people to come along and explain the gospel to them. And maybe it's you. Maybe the person isn't going to put it on a TV and listen to some preacher. Maybe it's you sharing this incredible plan of salvation that Jesus died on the cross to make a way that you can have access to the Father. Amen. She said, I remember accepting Christ Jesus after following a prayer. I prayed a prayer salvation. Are you okay to pray a prayer of salvation with somebody? I burned everything because I wanted to renounce the practice and it was like a new beginning for me. Renounce means literally I distance myself with this. I, I, I don't agree with that. That's what renounce means. And she said, when I accepted Christ, I managed to find my spiritual healing. Folks, there isn't healing outside of Christ. You can go to spiritists and witch doctors, etc., try and find healing I'm just warning you, you're going to find other stuff there that you don't want. But there's true healing in Christ. I found the healing that I was longing for. I felt really liberated this morning in prayer. We were praying. Uh, uh, Rebecca had the, the scenes from the book of Acts 16 where they were worshipping and literally the chains fell off them. God wants to set people free. God wants to set people free this morning. Amen. You don't have to leave church still with chains on. She said, I felt really liberated, like I was being taken out of prison. And she said further, I'm thinking what the Word of God is concerning my life. Amen? The good plans, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. She's spending time in the Word of God. What do I need to do that is pleasing to God? And the Bible said that it's only by faith that I can please God. Remember one of the points is, in seeking direction, it is by faith. We need to have faith for the direction that we believe God is leading us into. It's only by living what the Word of God says that I can live the new life. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Paul. And, and I want to pray for you. So there are three things that we highlighted here this, this morning. We want to follow God. We want to seek Him. But that means we can't follow cultural or social trends that do not align with God. We can't uh, follow friends who not, are not following God and have a negative influence in us. And we can't follow other spirits or occultic signs to seek direction from God. That's not God's stuff. That's not the God's zone. The Bible clearly warns us against that. And so I want to I pray. And for some of you, it may mean a choice, a decision. Remember Mpo said? She said, I had a choice. I couldn't choose my grandmother and my aunt. She said, I chose this man who had this robe of light. Will you choose Jesus? Will you choose God's way? For some of you, it's just simply the lights have gone on and you are saying, I need to choose. Can we all stand so we can pray together? Let's all stand. 
If you come here and it's like, oh my goodness, I know I've had chains on. That was the prayer. We prayed the chains would come off this morning. Amen. And so that's we're gonna we're gonna pray. And folks, I just want your eyes closed. You're doing business with God. The most important thing, you are choosing Jesus. You are choosing His way. You're choosing the way of life this morning. Whether it's social and cultural trends that, you are, that you've been following, whether it's friends that have had a negative influence or maybe family members, whether it's following spiritual, sort of spiritualists or all kinds of other spirits, you know what it is. The Holy Spirit is working in your heart to highlight things. It's not from me. I am trusting, we are trusting, we're praying, Holy Spirit, right now, Lord, we want to follow you. We want, we want, and I pray for every one of us here, your good plans, Lord, your plans to prosper and not to harm, your plans to give a hope and a future. Father, we want those plans. But Lord, for some of us, we've gone down wrong paths, Lord. We've gone with wrong people. We've been influenced by trends and, and things that we know have not been good for us. And for some of us, we've been following spirits that are not of God. And this morning, Lord, pray with me. Can you pray with me? Say, Lord Jesus, this morning, I choose you. And as I choose you, Lord, I renounce the wrong paths. I distance myself from social and cultural trends that don't please you. I will establish boundaries with friends who have not been following you. And I renounce evil spirits that are not of you. Forgive me, Lord, for following signs that are not of you. I repent, Lord. I turn from those paths. I turn to you, Jesus. I turn to your way, to your good plans, to your good future. I give myself to you, Lord, and your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For more information, please visit our website at www.hispeoplepmb.co.za. And for more of our messages, visit our YouTube and SoundCloud channels, as well as other podcast platforms. If you would like to contact us, please email us at hispeoplepmb at gmail.com or send a message to 061-452-0877. To join us for in-person services, visit us at 154 Burkett Road, Scottsville, Peter Maritzburg. We hope to see you soon. God bless you.